with uh, Erez Ullach, and also uh, on some earlier work uh, in particular, mostly on, on this paper uh, that appeared uh, three years ago. Uh, so, uh, well, the goal is to derive the ADS uh, CFT correspondence. So, let me uh, begin by uh, discussing uh, what does it mean uh, to derive the ADS CFT correspondence. So, I remind you that the ADS CFT correspondence uh, is an equivalence uh, between uh, some uh, quantum gravity theory uh, on anti de Sitter space in d plus one dimensions, or more precisely on asymptotically anti de Sitter space, since uh, the metric fluctuates uh, in the interior. And we believe that these theories are completely equivalent to conformal field theories uh, in, uh, in D space time uh, dimensions. Now, this duality uh, relates two theories that look uh, completely different uh, from each other. Uh, so, of course, it's, it's very surprising, uh, but by now we've gotten used uh, to having many dualities of this type, also in quantum field theory, that relate theories that look uh, very differently. The way that it works in quantum field theory is usually we start from some weak couple theory, and then as we turn on the coupling, at very strong coupling, sometimes it goes over to a different theory uh, written in terms of completely different degrees of freedom, uh, which is weakly coupled. And the idea of safety correspondence, uh, it works uh, a, bit, uh, a bit differently because the weak coupling limits uh, are not uh, the same uh, on both sides. Uh, by the way, this is a blackboard talk, so please do stop me with questions uh, at any time. I mean, feel, feel free. Uh, so the weak coupling uh, limit uh, on the gravity side of the idea of safety correspondence, where this gravitational theory is weakly coupled, maps to some uh, large n uh, limit on the CFT side. I mean, it could be a, a large n gauge theory in some cases, uh, in which case it's dual to a weakly coupled string theory, or you could have other types of large n uh, theories. But the weak coupling uh, limit on the gravity side always maps to some large n limit uh, on the field theory side. So in particular, h bar of, of the quantum gravity theory uh, grows in this direction. Uh, while the weak coupling uh, limit uh, on the field theory side maps to a different parameter, which is independent uh, of n. And the weak coupling limit uh, on the gravity side maps to having a large curvature and to having a light high spin field. I mean, one way to see that is that in, uh, in free field theories, uh, we have conserved currents of, of any uh, spin, which would map to massless uh, uh, high spin fields uh, living here in the bulk uh, on the ADS side. And when the theory is weakly coupled, we still have light uh, high spin uh, fields. So uh, H bar of the quantum field theory goes in this direction. And in principle, these are two independent expansions. Uh, so uh, it's not not I mean, so it's not necessarily well. So it's not a standard weak spin coupling uh, duality of the type that we have in field theory. And of course, one uh, important uh, aspect of this is that we can, in principle, be in a regime where we have weak coupling on both sides. So if we have a large n a large n field theory which is very weakly coupled, say the n equals four theory at a fifth coupling going to zero, uh, then we have weak coupling on both sides. And of course, that's the best case for hopefully having a derivation uh, of the duality. Uh, in this case, we have just two classical theories that uh, we hopefully should be able to, to map uh, to each other and, and in this way uh, 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 start uh, deriving uh, the ADS uh, CFT correspondence. Uh, so our goal in this talk will be to do this uh, for uh, not for the n equals four superiagonal theory, uh, but at least for the simpler case uh, of the duality, uh, which is uh, the case of uh, vector models. Now, uh, what does it mean uh, to derive a duality of this type? Of course, in quantum field theory, in some cases, in two dimensions, we can really derive dualities by constructing an explicit mapping uh, between the two sides of the duality and so on. But usually, even in field theory, we don't really know how to derive dualities. And in that sense, we can just uh, provide the evidence for them. Uh, in the case of the idea CFT correspondence, uh, the situation is different because uh, the left-hand side here, these quantum gravity theories are not really well defined. Uh, in some cases, if they're string theories, then we have a perturbative definition for them. But we don't have any non perturbative uh, definition of, uh, of what uh, these theories are. So, in this case, we really have a relation between conformal field theory, which in principle is well defined uh, for any value of the coupling, and uh, mapping to some quantum gravity theory, uh, which is really all, only well defined uh, perturbatively. So, uh, so, I think the correct way to view the ADS CFT correspondence usually is just as saying that the conformal field theory, which is well defined, just defines for us what we mean by a non perturbative definition. For the quantum gravity theory that we have on the left hand side and therefore what it means to derive the duality i mean the best possible sense which we could have for deriving the duality is to show that that conformal field theory has an appropriate limit where it looks like a classical gravity theory on adsd plus one and if we also understand the perturbative expansion on the left hand side uh, when we have a weakly coupled string theory then we should show that that conformal field theory completely reproduces for us the perturbative expansion uh, that we have uh, on the left hand side and of course, it then provides a, a non-perturbative completion uh, for that uh, non-perturb for that uh, 
uh, perturbative uh, expansion. So our goal will be to do that. I mean, so to start from some CFT and rewrite it in different variables such that it will look like uh, classical or semi-classical uh, gravity theory on ADS space. And I think uh, that's really the best we can hope for uh, in terms of uh, deriving the, the ADS CFT correspondence. So our goal is just to construct a, a mapping uh, from CFT variables uh, to gravity variables uh, on ADS space. And of course, having such a mapping, such an explicit mapping uh, could be very useful for answering various conceptual questions uh, about uh, uh, quantum gravity um, uh, that, that we may ask. I mean, we want to know, uh, is the gravity theory non-perturbatively, can it be written as a sum over metrics and topologies, or does it have to be written in completely different variables? Uh, do we have a geometry behind black hole horizons and so on? I mean, it, it, whenever we have an explicit mapping, we should at least in principle be able to, to answer uh, uh, all of these questions. So our goal will be to construct uh, an explicit uh, mapping uh, of, uh, of this type. Uh, again, in the case of, of matrix models like the N equals four supreme most theories, then those are rather complicated, even in this limit where both sides are classical. So, so on, on the field theory side, we have their, the classical theory, but it's a classical theory, large N theory of, of matrices and with, with a Gauss law constraint imposed on them. So that's a rather complicated theory. And also on the string theory side, uh, we have uh, the, the theory on, on ADS uh, uh, with, the, with the smallest possible uh, radius. And of course, there's a continuous progress on understanding that, in particular by rejection uh, collaborators. Uh, but we still have not been able to, to really construct an explicit mapping between the two sides, even in this limit where both sides are weakly coupled. But I'll show that in the case of vector models, uh, we can uh, construct uh, uh, such an explicit uh, mapping. So that's uh, the interaction and the motivations. Well, hopefully the motivation for deriving the correspondence uh, is clear. Uh, so are there any questions about the motivations before I go into the specific example uh, that I want to discuss? Okay, so uh, the specific example uh, I'll focus on uh, throughout this talk is uh, the mapping uh, between uh, vector models uh, on the field theory side and high spin gravity uh, models uh, on the uh, quantum uh, gravity side. So uh, on, the, on the quantum field theory side, uh, we'll have uh, what are called uh, vector models, uh, which is a, a fancy name uh, for just uh, taking uh, n free fields, free massless uh, complex scalar uh, fields. So yeah. Phi i of x, and uh, of course the theory of, of free massless fields uh, is, is obviously a, a conformal uh, field theory. Now, if I just take n free fields uh, by themselves, then that doesn't really have a large unlimit uh, because they don't talk to each other. So, in order to have a good uh, large unlimit, we need to focus on the UN invariant uh, sector uh, of this theory, and I'll discuss it uh, just in the case of uh, flat space uh, for simplicity. So, I'll take these fields in, in d space time dimensions and uh, and consider just the theory in flat space. In that case, taking the UN invariant sector just means that I can impose a, a projection on the Hilbert space to include only states of these fields. So I here goes from 1 to n, and we want to look only at states that are invariant under the UN rotations uh, of these n uh, scalar fields. And similarly, only look at operators uh, that are invariant uh, under, under these uh, uh, rotations. Uh, so in general manifolds, it may be a bit complicated to impose this projection, but at least uh, on RD, uh, there are no uh, subtleties, and we can just uh, truncate the Hilbert space and the space of operators uh, to the space uh, of, of invariant uh, of, of objects invariant under UN. And this theory uh, was conjectured by uh, Klebanov and Podikov uh, almost uh, 20 years ago uh, to be dual to a high spin uh, gravity theory living uh, on ADS uh, d plus one. I'll consider here uh, only the case where d is bigger or equal to three. So in particular, we could take them in three dimensions or four dimensions where they would map to uh, ADS theories uh, on ADS four uh, or, or on a uh, or an ADS-5. Now, uh, these, uh, these high-spin uh, gravity theories, uh, not too much uh, is known about them. I mean, they were studied uh, by, by Vasiliev and, and then by, by uh, many others. Uh, they're certainly not uh, well-defined uh, non-perturbatively or even uh, perturbatively. Uh, basically, the main thing that's known about these, these high-spin gravity theories are that there are known classical uh, equations of motion uh, for them that were written uh, by Vasiliev. We don't even have any action uh, for these theories that would enable us to, to formulate uh, even uh, say uh, loop computations or uh, comparing uh, different uh, backgrounds and so on. So far, all we have uh, on, the, on the on the left hand side uh, in this case uh, is is just uh, the classical equations of motion. But of course, we believe that there is some quantum theory uh, that in the classical limit 
uh, reduces to those classical equations of motion and uh, deriving the idea of CFT correspondence uh, in this case uh, just means uh, rewriting uh, this, uh, this field theory in some other uh, set of variables uh, where it will look like a high spin uh, gravity uh, theory uh, with uh, the appropriate uh, classical uh, limit. Now, in some sense, uh, this example of the duality uh, is, is the simplest one because uh, on the field theory side, we really just have here uh, n, n free fields. So, of course, we know how to compute anything we want. And in the large n theory, also the gravity side is weakly coupled. So, the classical equation of motion with a coupled constant, which is, uh, well, you could view as, say, Newton's constant here in units of ADSD plus one, and it scales like uh, one over n. So, in the large n limit, both sides are weakly coupled. And we should be able to just uh, construct, uh, if you want, even a, a classical map uh, between the two sides, which we can then uh, expand around uh, uh, to get uh, uh, the quantum uh, theory. So that's uh, the big advantage uh, of this uh, example. Of course, uh, the, the big disadvantage is that the gravity theories on this, these high spin gravity theories are very different from the gravity theories that we're interested in. In particular, these high spin gravity theories are non local at the scale uh, of the ADS radius. So they don't have any approximate locality uh, below the ADS scale, as, as in uh, uh, other uh, examples uh, of the ADS uh, CFT correspondence that we like. And also, they have uh, massless high spin fields of every spin. So not just uh, the gravity on the spin two, but there are massless uh, spin fields uh, of every spin, which uh, map uh, on this side to conserve their currents. So on the field theory side, uh, in this uh, in this uh, free theory, we have conserved spin J currents. And the usual rules uh, of the ADS CFT correspondence tell us that they map uh, to massless uh, high spin fields. So, so obviously, this theory is, is very different from a, from a standard uh, classical uh, gravity theory. And uh, there are some questions uh, that we won't be able to ask uh, on this side, uh, but it is still uh, some uh, uh, gravity uh, theory. And uh, well, our goal will be to derive the ADS CFT correspondence uh, for this case, just because uh, we can do it uh, in this case. And uh, of course, the one advantage of doing it in this case is that if we can construct such a mapping uh, from the field theory side to the gravity side, then automatically it will give us also a quantum generalization of this uh, Vasiliev theory. I mean, so automatically we will get some action for this theory and uh, in which uh, loop computations and so on uh, will be well defined. Uh, so uh, so uh, as, as a side effect of deriving the ADS CFT correspondence in, in this case, uh, we will also uh, uh, derive a quantum version uh, of this uh, uh, high spin gravity theory, which again, uh, by virtue of our derivation, uh, will be completely equivalent uh, to this uh, uh, conformal field theory uh, that, that, we, uh, that we start from. So again, our goal will be to construct an explicit uh, mapping uh, from uh, this uh, UN invariant sector of the theory of n free fields uh, to this high spin gravity theory, uh, such that we can rewrite our field theory uh, as, a, as a quantum uh, uh, gravity theory. On, uh, Ofer, can on I uh, Yes, please. Uh, this is a good time for questions, yes. Yeah, so the um, the truncation to the UN invariant sector, what does it exactly mean? I mean, I, you are not introducing some uh, gauge field to do it, or is there some uh, uh, mass gap, uh, uh, you know, energy gap or something that you have in mind? Yeah, so, so okay, so, so that's a good question. I mean, so, so what I will mean by this is really just uh, truncating the, I mean, in principle, this theory has some Hilbert space, it has some space of operators acting on that Hilbert space. What I will mean is just truncating the Hilbert space and the space of operators only to objects that are invariant under UN. Now, of course, doing it in that way is, is not really a local operation. I mean, it's some global truncation of the Hilbert space. What you are implying, I think, is that if I want to do this uh, locally, this truncation into UN invariants, uh, then I need to couple this theory uh, to UN uh, gauge fields uh, in order to accomplish that. But of course, the problem is that generally that would change the, the dynamics uh, also and mm -hmm. make the theory much more complicated. It really becomes a matrix model. Now, there's one special case where we can do that without changing the dynamics that, of course, uh, you're very familiar with, which is the case of three dimensions. So if this theory is in three dimensions, then we can couple it to UN turn sandwich fields and take the turn sandwich level to infinity. And in that case, we, we do not uh, change the dynamics. So in the special case of 3D, one way to think about this theory is by coupling it to turn sandwich gauge fields and taking K to infinity. Uh, but and, and then if we do that, then it's really local, and then we can also put it on other manifolds and so on. So that's one way to think about this, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, I won't really uh, need that. I mean, because that does introduce more complications of all these gauge fields and so on. And for the purposes of my talk, I'm, I'm really just treating the theory in the flat space, and then it's really just enough to project the space of operators and uh, and the Hilbert space. So that's what I, what I have in mind. But you're right, you. this is not local, and only in 3D I know how to make it local in the way that I discussed. Mm -hmm.
So, so in particular, because it's not local, just because I know how to do this mapping, for instance, on RD doesn't automatically tell me how to perform a similar mapping on other manifolds. So, so I'm, I'm emphasizing here that we know how to do this for RD, but not necessarily for other manifolds. I mean, of course, that's a, it would be nice to, to generalize, but for now, I'm just doing this uh, simplest case. Um, Are there any other hello? questions? Uh, also? Yes. Uh, hello? Yes, hi. Yeah, uh, so this projection is unitary. Hi, 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 hi. Is it unitary, this projection to the singlet sector? Uh, so, sorry, I didn't understand the question. Yeah, so, so I was asking this projection to the singlet sector that, uh, that yes. you're describing. Is it, you know, does it give you a unitary theory at the end? Um, uh, well, yeah, so that's uh, okay. So, so again, this is, this is the free theory. So, uh, I mean, it, it, I, as a projection on flat space, I think it gives me a unitary theory since it's just a projection of the same Hilbert space, but it, it's not a local, it's not something that I can do locally, except in this 3D case where I can do it through coupling uh, to turn Simon's uh, fields. So, so in that sense, I think it, it is still unitary, but it's, uh, but it's not, uh, again, it's, it's not local. And of course, if you, so if you would try to get, say, get, try to get a unitarity cut for scattering or something, of course, in the free theory, we don't really have that, but of course, uh, in, in general, in intermediate states, you might need a, uh, you might need a, a non-UN invariant states uh, appearing as intermediate states, uh, but that's only if you really want to think of it locally in terms of uh, particles or something like that. I mean, just as a truncation of the Hilbert space, in some sense, it's by construction unitary since I'm just uh, keeping a subset of my Hilbert space. But I mean, uh, but I, I agree that that's uh, sort of a very weak uh, meaning of what I mean by unitary. And uh, and yes, I mean, if, if I really want to do this, uh, if I want it to be both unitary and local, then in 3D, I can do that by coupling to the turn Simon's gauge field, but in other dimensions, I don't really know how to do that. So, so, so isn't it clear why it's unitary? You have a Hamiltonian, which is a free Hamiltonian, it's Hermitian, and yes. it doesn't couple yes. these, non, these singlets to non-singlets. So this is a- Exactly, yeah. right. So, so, so that's so right, so in that sense, it's unitary, yes, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, of course, we'll, we'll be interested later also in deforming this theory and, and so on. I mean, and when you deform the theory, say it might be more natural when you do interactions to, I mean, of course, a singlet of UN could go into two non singlets, I mean, which are together in a singlet state, but uh, I mean, in some cases, it may be more natural to include also the non singlet states. But yeah, of course, uh, the full truncation to singlets is also unitary uh, in this uh, trivial sense of, of giving a unitary evolution uh, in time. Yes. <laughs> Any uh, further questions? Okay, so let's uh, start uh, deriving this duality. Now, there have been already many attempts uh, throughout the years uh, to, generate, to uh, derive this duality. Uh, in most cases, people have tried to get the radial direction of ADS space somehow from some renormalization group uh, scaled uh, in the field theory. Uh, what, what we'll do is, is take a very naive uh, brute force approach of really just uh, taking the field theory path integral and just uh, mapping it directly uh, to the gravity side. And this general approach uh, goes under the name of uh, bilocal uh, holography. And this was, I think, uh, pioneered uh, by Dustin Javitsky almost uh, 20 years ago. And of course, it was extensively used by uh, many people, uh, including uh, many people uh, in, in the audience. And uh, the basic uh, idea of this uh, formalism is that we can write UN invariant operators uh, so if you want to write UN invariant operators, then one way to do it is just to contract the indices of two of these uh, scalar fields. So we can construct bilocal operators that are invariant under UN by just taking uh, this uh, combination of phi i dagger x times phi i of y and summing uh, over all the, all the indices. So these operators are obviously uh, UN invariant, uh, but uh, the more uh, interesting thing is that these are also all the UN invariant operators, namely that any UN invariant operator in this theory can be written just in terms of, of these uh, bilocals. So this would not be true, for instance, if I had an, if I only put in SUN invariant, then I would also have variants and so on, which could not be written in terms of these bilocals. But uh, when I have a UN uh, theory, uh, then uh, it is a, a correct statement that all the invariants can just be written uh, in terms of this uh, bilocal. And then uh, that means that, in particular, the path integral that I want to start from on the gravity side. So what I, one way to interpret what I mean by truncating to the UN invariant sector uh, on, the, on the field theory side is that I have uh, this, uh, this field theory uh, path integral over these n uh, scalar fields with just uh, the free uh, massless action. So just uh, giving you phi i squared. I'll work in Euclidean space uh, for simplicity. And then I can uh, couple this uh, to some source uh, for this uh, 
for these uh, by locals. And in principle, uh, this as a function of j generates for me all the UN invariant correlation functions uh, uh, in, in this uh, field theory. So our goal will be to, to take uh, this path integral, which captures all the UN invariant information in the quantum field theory, and to map this uh, to the gravity side uh, uh, of the correspondence. Now, how will we do this? Uh, we're going to do this in, in, three, uh, in three steps, and I'll discuss uh, each of those uh, steps uh, in detail. Uh, our first step uh, will be a change of variables in this path integral from our original fields phi to these bilocals uh, g of uh, xi xj. So this is just a, a change of variables uh, in the field theory. Then uh, in the next step, uh, we'll take these uh, bilocals and we'll decompose them into irreducible representations of the conformal group. So, uh, of course, one thing, well, we don't know much about how this mapping is supposed to work, but one thing that we do know is that we have this uh, group SOD plus 1, 1, which on the field theory side is the conformal group. Obviously, this is a conformally invariant theory. And on the gravity side, we know that this should work as the isometries of ADS space, at least uh, asymptotically. Uh, so we know how this group is supposed to act on both sides. And thus, uh, the way that we're going to map uh, between the two sides is to just uh, decompose everything into irreducible representations uh, of this uh, conformal group SOD plus 1, 1. So we'll take uh, these bilocal operators and decompose them into irreducible representations. So we'll just do the decomposition into irreducible representations of SOD plus 1, 1. As I'll describe, uh, these representations are labeled by some uh, dimension, some spin, and some point uh, in space time. So and for spin j operators, we'll have some indices here. And uh, so uh, we'll show that there is a complete set of representations that are labeled by these indices delta j and y. And then I can expand this by local field in these representations. And we'll have some coefficients uh, c that will, will be the, the coefficients of that expansion into irreducible uh, representations. So that will be uh, the second step. And then in the third step, we'll see that we can rearrange uh, these coefficients uh, that we got into completely uh, different objects that will look like spin j fields uh, living on anti Sitter space. So that's eventually our goal will be to show that we can then rearrange these coefficients in a different way into spin j fields uh, that, that, uh, that live on, on anti Sitter space. So again, I'll, in the rest of the talk, I'll give uh, uh, all the details about uh, these uh, three steps. And together, these three steps will give us a mapping of the path integral to a path integral uh, in some quantum gravity theory uh, on ADS space. And the nice thing will be that this, uh, the, the two steps in the middle here are just going to be linear transformations uh, from these bilocals uh, to the fields of phi. And of course, uh, the reason we can have such a relatively simple mapping is because of this important fact that we have the same classical limit on both sides. So uh, there, in the classical limit, it should just be some uh, transformation of variables to go from one side to the other. And we'll, explicit, uh, we'll exhibit uh, that uh, change of variables explicitly. Uh, as a, as a hand-waving way to understand why bilocal fields can be mapped to spin J fields uh, on ADS space. So here I'm using sort of coordinates for ADS space where the Z is the radial coordinate and X is the coordinate uh, parallel uh, to the boundary. So we can think of this X as coming from the center of mass position uh, of this uh, bilocal, say XI plus XJ uh, over, over two. Uh, and then we have uh, the distance between the two points that schematically maps to the radial uh, coordinate in ADS. And then uh, the angular directions in XI minus XJ uh, those we can expand in spherical harmonics and obtain uh, these uh, spin j fields. So, uh, so at the level of hand waving, that's why in some sense we have the same counting of degrees of freedom in this my local field and in this tower of spin j fields uh, living on ADS space. But again, uh, we'll exhibit that uh, completely explicitly uh, in the rest of, of the talk. So, so this is uh, the plan uh, for the rest of the talk. And uh, are there any questions uh, before I start getting into the details? <laughs> Um, Opa, I think you're probably going to explain this in detail. The step A uh, mm -hmm. uh, is a transformation from, uh, I'm just uh, counting the deg degrees of freedom here. So phi i of x is something like n times the volume of space. Yeah, well, that, 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 point, that point is exactly the next point that I want to make. So maybe hold that question uh, for, uh, for two minutes. And, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, that, uh, yeah, that's uh, an important uh, point, of course. So yeah, so let me start by uh, describing in detail uh, this first step. So the first step, I just want to do a change of variables in the field theory uh, from this phi i of x to this uh, bilocal, say, g of x1, x2, which again is just defined by 1 over n, the sum of 
I I wrote x1 I I uh, x2. Uh, now, in principle, this step should be trivial because it's just in, in the field theory. So some change of variables in the field theory. There's no quantum gravity involved uh, or anything. Uh, but the problem is that this change of variables uh, is uh, nonlinear, and these g's are not completely uh, independent uh, of each other. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if I take the simplest case where n is just one, so I just have uh, one uh, one free uh, field. Uh, so, of course, in that case, we just this index i just takes the value one, and g x one x two times g x three x four is just equal to uh, phi one dagger x one phi x two phi one dagger x three phi one x four, and of course this is the same as uh, taking also g x one x four times g x two x three. So in the case of n equals one, for instance, we have th these g's are not independent uh, of each other, but they obey these uh, quadratic uh, constraints uh, for every choice of four points in space time x one x two x three and x four. So they obey uh, these uh, complicated uh, constraints. For higher values of n, uh, then the, the constraints become uh, more complicated, uh, but we still have uh, constraints uh, if we take the product of more than n uh, fields. So for higher values of n, we get constraints on, on g to the power uh, n plus 1. Now, how do we see this? Uh, so one way to, to see this uh, is to regulate, regulate uh, the field theory. Uh, so analyzing these constraints in the continuum limit is, is rather uh, complicated, uh, but we can put the field theory uh, on the lattice. So we'll take this uh, free field theory to, to live uh, on the lattice with uh, v points. So this imposes both a UV cutoff and an IR cutoff by just putting uh, the theory on, on some, on some uh, lattice, such that uh, this index A takes, takes values in, uh, in, in some set of uh, V different uh, values that are the, the lattice uh, sites. And uh, in this way uh, of thinking about it, we can think of this uh, phi I of X as being an N by V uh, matrix, where the index I goes from one to N, and this index X takes these uh, V possible uh, values. And then uh, the relation between uh, G and phi can just be written as G equals, uh, in, in terms of uh, matrix multiplication, just as G equals phi dagger phi, where here we, we sum over this, uh, this uh, I uh, index. So, th so this G is a V by V matrix. It's, it's labeled by uh, two uh, positions. And this V by V matrix is just the product of this V by N matrix times uh, an N uh, by V matrix. And in this language, it sort of becomes obvious uh, what the constraints are, since you can write G as a product of two N by V uh, matrices then it necessarily has to obey that the rank of G is less than or equal uh, to N, even though G is a general V by V matrix, it has to obey uh, this constraint. And for N equals one, that's exactly uh, this, uh, this constraint uh, that I wrote. But in general, uh, this is uh, the constraint uh, that this uh, G uh, has, to, has to obey. And uh, this is basically what makes this, uh, this change of variables uh, complicated. Uh, the fact that the G's are not arbitrary, but, uh, but they have to, to obey uh, this, uh, this constraint. Now, uh, there are then two cases that we can uh, analyze. Uh, so one case, which is I'll focus on in most of this, this uh, talk, is the case where n is bigger or equal than v. So in particular, that will be true in the large n limit, as long as I take the large n limit before taking uh, the continuum limit. So the idea here is that I'll first uh, regularize the theory, then take the large n limit, and only then uh, take, uh, take the continuum limit of, of v goes to infinity. So if we analyze the theory in this order of limits, then n is always bigger than v. And then, of course, this constraint is trivial. I mean, the v by v matrix always has a rank uh, less than or equal to, to n. So, so in this case, there, there are no constraints. And we can just uh, directly map uh, the, say, the, the measure uh, in the space of phi's uh, to a measure uh, on these by local fields. So we can show that this measure, just by change of variables up to some constant, is just equal to a path integral over these uh, by local fields. With the Jacobian, which is a step, the determinant of this matrix G, again viewed as a, as a V by V uh, matrix, raised to the power uh, N minus uh, V. So, so in this case, we can just explicitly do the, the change of variables, and then we can plug this uh, into the path integral. So in this case, we can rewrite the path integral that we had before uh, on the other blackboard. So we can just directly write it as a path integral over this uh, by local field. We had this uh, kinetic term for phi, so it's easy to, to write that uh, in terms of the by local field. It just involves some. Uh, Two derivatives of gxy with respect to x and y evaluated at x equals to y, and uh, so this is a, this is the term that we get just from the free classical action of the phi's, and then the other term that we get is uh, comes from the set determinant, which as usual we can write as the trace of a log. So we have here a term that's uh, n minus v times trace uh, of log of g, and then uh, in addition we have this uh, the source term uh, that we had before. So that just uh, goes for the right since it was already written in terms of a uh, g. So for this case where n is uh, large enough, uh, 
uh, then this path integral written in terms of this bilocal field is completely equivalent uh, to the original path integral uh, that we had uh, in, in the phase. So this is uh, basically uh, uh, the, the first uh, step uh, that, that, we, that we need uh, to do. And it gives us, uh, again, an explicit rewriting of the theory uh, within, in this variable uh, g. Uh, if n is uh, less than v, then things are more complicated because we can still write it as a path integral uh, over this uh, by local variable, but then we must impose uh, these constraints. And that turns out to be rather complicated. Of course, it can be done by introducing uh, lots of auxiliary fields uh, and, and so on. Uh, but I won't really discuss uh, uh, that case uh, in, in any uh, detail uh, today in, in the talk. Uh, so for now, I'll focus on uh, taking uh, the large n limit. Uh, and the large n limit, this is explicitly equal to the original path integral that we started from for any values of n and v that obey this. And uh, the only thing uh, to remember is that if I want to then discuss uh, smaller values of n or take the continual limit for finite n, then we have to remember that these variables will become constrained uh, by, by these, uh, these rank, uh, rank relations. So that's, uh, so that's uh, the, the essence uh, uh, of the first uh, step. Now, uh, as, as you can see, uh, the path integral over G that I wrote here again, this is valid for any values of N and V, but in particular in this path integral, we can now do a one over N expansion uh, because we have N appearing in front of uh, uh, the first uh, two terms here. And uh, well, I also normalize the source term to have N. Uh, so we obviously have a one over N expansion by expanding around the shallow points of this. And in this context, we have this term that's proportional to V. V, I remind you, is essentially the UV cutoff or the ratio of the UV to the IR cutoffs. So in that context, we can think of this as some one loop counter term depending on the UV cutoff, uh, which is necessary uh, in order to have the equivalence uh, between uh, this path integral of the G's and the original path integral uh, of, of the phi's. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a large-end theory where we explicitly also have a, a specific one loop counter term that's necessary to get a precise equivalence uh, uh, between the, the two sides. Now, what does the, the large N expansion uh, look like? So, of course, they have to expand around some saddle point uh, of, of, uh, of these, uh, these leading terms. Now, uh, it's easy to guess what that saddle point is because in this uh, free field theory, the expectation value of G is not zero, but I remind you, G is just this uh, product of phi i dagger x times phi i of y, and this expectation value is just the propagator of this free massless uh, scalar field, so it's just proportional to x minus y uh, to the power d minus 2. So I'll call this uh, some g0 of x and y. So that's just, uh, uh, well, that's what we expect the expectation value of g to be. And we, one can also easily check that it is indeed uh, the saddle point that you get from the leading order equations of motion. Just keeping uh, the first two terms here, computing the equations of motion. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is the solution. Uh, to, well, this is the, the saddle point uh, for this uh, path integral. And then uh, what we can do is we can just expand uh, our, our variable g around this uh, saddle point, which again is just the, the free field uh, propagator, and we'll call the deviation away from that uh, eta x1, x2. And then we can rewrite our path integral in the language of the field eta, where by construction in the variable eta, uh, we won't have any linear terms. I mean, we'll only have uh, quadratic terms and interaction terms. And I normalized the field eta here uh, such that we're only going to have, uh, such that the interactions will be explicitly suppressed uh, by one over n. So let's uh, do that in, uh, in detail. So uh, one nice thing about this uh, G0 uh, is that G0, of course, is the Green's function uh, for the Laplacian uh, in these space-time dimensions. Uh, so in this matrix notation, uh, the inverse of this G0 is just uh, the, the Laplacian uh, times, uh, times the delta function. And therefore, if I rewrite the action that I had for G, if I now just expand it uh, around this uh, saddle point, uh, then uh, the first term just gives me in this normalization the square root n of trace g0 minus 1 of beta. I mean, so this uh, Laplacian turns out to be exactly the same as, as the inverse uh, of this matrix uh, g0. And then uh, the other terms uh, uh, that we have there uh, on the first line, uh, written in terms of this theory, we have the trace of the log of 1 plus. So again, I'm expanding uh, g, and I can rewrite this as, uh, well, I can rewrite the log of g is the log of g0 plus 1 over square root n of g0 minus 1 times eta. So this is uh, rewriting uh, the action uh, in, in, this, uh, in this new variable expanding around the saddle point. And you can explicitly see that indeed uh, the linear term in eta just cancels out uh, when we expand uh, this log. Of course, that has to be the case uh, for a saddle point. And then uh, what we get is we get, so we get some kinetic term that looks like the trace of g minus 1 eta uh, squared. Uh, we get some uh, interaction terms, which we can explicitly write down. So we get interaction terms that are all suppressed by some powers uh, of 1 over n. 
and that looked like trace of just zero minus one eta raised to the power n. And in addition to those, we have these uh, counter terms uh, that that again are, are all suppressed by powers of n. So they they go like this. All the interactions are suppressed at least by square root of n, and the counter terms in this case take a very similar form to the original uh, action. So in the context, uh, so again, this is just the change of variables to this uh, new variable eta, and we have an explicit path integral in the field theory again. The exact path integral takes that form, but in the one where an expansion, uh, I can expand it uh, in, in this way. And of course, it's easy to check that this new path integral uh, for this eta variable reproduces all the correlation functions uh, that we had uh, in our original uh, field theory. Uh, so for instance, uh, I can ask, uh, well, and uh, sorry, I should have said this. We can think of this eta in some sense as some normal order product of the scale of fields. I mean, where we take out the singular term coming from the contraction of the two fields, and uh, eta is in some sense the, the non-trivial part uh, of, of this uh, product of phi dagger to phi i. So, for instance, if I would compute uh, the two-point function of, of, of eta related to the four-point function of, of the original fields, uh, then at tree level in this action, I just get a contribution uh, uh, from this uh, propagator. Uh, which is, uh, well, if I just invert this matrix, what I get is g0, x1, x4, g0, x2, x3. So it's just a, a product of two scalar propagators corresponding to contracting the scalar fields between these points and between these points. That is, that's, of course, how I would compute this set in the free field theory. And then in the next order, in one over n, I get various diagrams uh, from this action. There's a diagram with the two three point vertices, uh, there's a diagram with the four point vertex, and there's a diagram uh, with a counter term uh, vertex. So all of those are of order uh, one over n. And uh, the, what one can check, which of course follows uh, from this derivation, is that these three diagrams exactly cancel. And of course, in the free field theory, this product of two propagators is the exact answer. And we can explicitly see from this action that we have a cancellation uh, between these, these diagrams. Again, the cancellation is not completely explicit uh, in, in this uh, language, but it's easy to check it uh, order by order in one over n. And of course, it, it follows uh, uh, from this uh, derivation. And all the higher order terms uh, also uh, cancel uh, in this case. So uh, in this way, we so far in the larger limit, we saw that we can rewrite our field theory as in this new uh, eta variable with some uh, action that has an explicit uh, one over n expansion. And so that's uh, the end of the first step. And in the rest of the talk, I'll try to translate this uh, to the uh, gravity side. So are there any questions uh, before that about this bilocal formulation on the field theory side? Uh, over, over question? Yes. Um, suppose I were to Because you already heard that talk. It's not fair. <laughs> Uh, suppose I were to take the continuum limit first, so take yes. to infinity, but uh, but uh, work at finite temperature. So I suppose I was interested in computing the finite temperature partition function, keep the temperature order one, and fix. Right. So so uh, the moment I have finite temperature, I, in order to impose this constraint, I have to introduce some holonomy uh, of the U and gauge fields uh, over the the circle, and then it becomes a matrix model, and then I have no idea how to do this mapping. I mean, so, so I stressed at the beginning that I know how to do this mapping for RD, but I don't know how to map it in the, to do it in the presence of a circle, and in particular, not for the thermal theory. That will certainly be much more complicated. And so, and, I mean, we're thinking about it, but we don't have any results uh, so far. Right. So I, I, I was mapping that I present is just for flat space. Good. But I was thinking that at temperatures order one, only the single, oh, you know, it's just a gas of singlets. So. Well, but as you know, I mean, at high enough temperatures, I mean, uh, it, it, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, there are different ways to rewrite it. I mean, but I mean, of course, it is always just a gas of singlets. Uh, but uh, at, at high temperatures, uh, it be, it looks uh, it looks well. We expect it to be complicated on the gravity side, and uh, maybe we even expect different saddle points on the gravity side, and so on. I mean, it's it becomes uh, certainly the phase transition to get this. Well, we know that there is a phase transition, and that it involves this holonomy, and so on. I mean, so I cannot uh, analyze that without introducing these many extra degrees of freedom that would come from the holonomy. Right, right, right. Uh, sorry, but I, that phase transition happens at temperature order square root n in this model. That's right. So suppose I keep temperature as order one <laughs> and send yes. into infinity so that the phase transition is not important. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if I just, yeah. So if I just want to work in that phase where the holonomy vanishes and uh, impose that by hand, then yes, then I can do the same thing. Sure. Yeah, I was I'm wondering whether, the, whether, whether your manipulations would even work in the continuum limit, then. you know, without doing this, without they, uh, doing this other uh, order well, of limits. Yeah, yeah. Much so, so, Right, so, so as, I, as I mentioned, I mean, these constraints, they constrain products of n, n or more of these uh, Gs. So as long as I have some gap and, uh, and I don't have states with more than n particles, then everything would be fine. And because I you mean, so I would see the problem is only when I take a product of n or more uh, of, of these bilocals. 
Right, and because you don't have, you have finite. Well, if I take n to infinity first, then that yeah. that goes away, and indeed uh, I can still do everything uh, that I said. Thank you. But of course, I wanted to, my whole point is to do a mapping that will make sense also for for finite n and so on, and and then uh, I, I don't know how to do that uh, in the thermal case. Thank you. Any uh, further questions about this uh, first uh, step? Okay. Um, so, just yes. one, uh, so the um, so your derivation of the expectation value of g x y, which g zero x y that that is uh, without the j term is that is that right without the source right yeah but of course yeah of course with the source I can then it will then be shifted right so this was of course for zero source but yeah we can then uh, just expand in the source I mean we can expand it perturbatively if we just want to compute correlation functions. Or we can put in finite sources, and then of course this will this will be shifted. So I'll discuss at the end the deformations of the theory, and then indeed uh, this will be shifted. So here I was assuming that the source is infinitesimal, and and then this is uh, this is valid. Uh, maybe one 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 other question which I should have asked. Before. Yes. Um, so for n greater than v, so <clears throat> it's like the space of phi i x is is a submanifold of the space of g x y. So, uh, like, uh, so the this change of variable thing for which you get the determinant of g to the power n minus v, does that come? I mean, how how do you get this? Well, so uh, of course the space of phi is bigger, but the point is that since I'm only interested in the un invariant information, then all the un invariant information is captured uh, just by this. I mean, so as long as I only discuss un invariant information, this is an invertible change of variables in some sense. I mean. Uh, Again, I'm not explicitly doing the projection here, but just uh, the fact that we do have, uh, I mean, so as long as my path integral on the right hand side only involves UN and various things, then this is really a, a completely legitimate change of variables. Of course, I cannot go back and, and reconstruct individual phi i's in this way, but any UN invariant information is not lost uh, by this change of variables if n is bigger or equal than v. I see. So the space of phi's is bigger, but not their UN invariant subspace. Uh, Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ofa. Um, yes. Uh, so uh, when you say uh, n is uh, greater than v, you uh, you are meaning also. I mean, uh, are you also taking v to scale with n to a smaller power? Supposing uh, you. No, well, it could. Uh, it, it doesn't have to. I mean, this is really completely exact. I mean, so as long as v scales as a smaller power of n, of course, it's fine. Or v could uh, just but, uh, be uh, I was just wondering uh, whether the the large n expansion, I'm really thinking of v is just some independent parameter that's independent of n. It's just my UV cutoff or the ratio of the UV and IR cutoffs. And I think that's the more natural way to think about it. And, and then, then this is just a one loop uh, counter term. But yeah, yeah, I could also consider it, other so, scalings. And as long as v scales slower than n, then everything would still work. But, uh, yeah. but then the large n expansion, of course, would be different. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I was just wondering whether there's something interesting in the regime where v is some alpha times n with alpha uh -huh. less than one. Uh, yes. Uh, then um, they are both yeah. of the same order and it's sort yeah. of. Uh, mm. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, in that case, it looks like sort of the saddle point uh, would be modified, but uh, well, it's modified by constant or something. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I haven't thought about that. Thanks. Uh, in particular, when n is equal to v, it looks very trivial almost. So I mean, so it's right. uh, that that's probably singular. But even alpha less than one is probably maybe there's something. There. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's true that the, the case of n equals v uh, here it looks like it would be a completely trivial theory. Um, so yeah, that's uh, well. Yeah, okay. I guess the cell point would just be singular in that case. So yeah, I'm not sure what exactly to expand around. But uh, yeah, it's, it, it may be interesting to expand around other values uh, indeed. Okay, thanks. Any further uh, questions? Okay, so next we want to take this uh, path integral that we got uh, for these bilocals and translate it to the gravity side. And uh, well, the question is, would we want to have on the gravity side up early? We don't know what are the right variables to describe this uh, quantum gravity theory on ADS space, of course, uh, it should be some high spin gravity theory where everything uh, fluctuates, we have this huge uh, gate symmetry and so on. It's not clear uh, what, what the theory should be uh, on, on the ADS side. The only thing that we really know about it is that at least uh, semi-classically, it should have uh, these uh, spin J fields. So as I said, uh, on the field theory side, we have these uh, spin J uh, local operators uh, that schematically look like phi i dagger x times uh, 
the J derivatives acting on pi of x. So these give us a conserved spin J current say on the field theory side that have a dimension d minus 2 plus j and that are exactly conserved in the free field theory and the usual of course from the bilocal point of view these just arise by expanding the bilocal uh, gx1 x2 around x1 equals x2 but so in particular of course we have these local operators and the general rules of ads cft tell me that these shouldn't have to uh, massless uh, spin j fields on ads so at least uh, so we expect to have a theory that has these massless uh, spin j fields uh, on ads d plus one but it's not clear uh, what are the right variables in which to, to describe uh, that theory? Since again, it's not it's not really a theory living on, on a fixed uh, space uh, or anything uh, like that. So uh, what we'll do uh, in order to write our theory as a gravity theory is really to make sort of the most naive possible assumption about what the correct variables are uh, on the gravity side. And that's that we'll take as our variables, uh, just spin J fields, phi J that will live uh, on an ADS space, so parameterized by X and Z. I mean, so say I'll, I can take the metric the metric on ADS space just to be the, the usual metric LADS squared times dx mu dx mu plus dz squared over z squared. So we know that we should have these spin J fields in some sense semi-classically living on some aspect of the ADS space, but a priori we have no idea what should be the correct degrees of freedom off shell on the gravity side. Of course, we're doing an exact mapping of path integrals, so it should work also off shell and not just on shell. Uh, but the guess that we'll make is that maybe we can take as the correct variables on the gravity side uh, just these uh, very naive uh, massless uh, spin J fields uh, living on a fixed uh, ADS uh, metric. Now, of course, at first sight, that's ridiculous to assume that on the gravity side, we can just write everything uh, on, on a fixed uh, metric. And in a standard theory, that wouldn't really make sense because we, we should certainly uh, have different possible uh, solutions uh, in the bulk. The point is that uh, the gravity theories in this case uh, have this uh, huge uh, high spin uh, uh, gate symmetry generalizing uh, diffeomorphisms, and it turns out that it is possible to write down uh, these high spin gravity theories uh, in a formalism, at least uh, at the level of the classical equations of motion, which is all that is known. Then, at least at left level, we can rewrite these theories as uh, as governing uh, uh, fields that live on a fixed uh, ADS uh, space time. So, in some sense, this high spin symmetry is so large that it enables us to just always take the metric. To just read the metric of ADS space and then view all the fields just as uh, living on that fixed uh, ADS space and sort of as fluctuations uh, around the ADS uh, solution. So at the classical level, again, this would not be true, of course, in most cases of ADS CFT, but just in this special case with the high spin gravity. At the classical level, we know that it is possible to re rewrite the equations in terms of just fields living on a fixed uh, ADS uh, background. And so what we'll guess is that also at the level of these offshell of this offshell mapping uh, that we want to construct. We'll guess that you can still write, uh, so these are spin J fields on this AD, fixed uh, ADS space, and we'll guess that those are the correct variables uh, that we want to use, namely that we want to map our bilocal variable at x1, x2 that we already constructed uh, to these, uh, to these uh, spin, J, spin J fields uh, living on, uh, on ADS space. Uh, and again, the justification will be that we know that it's possible to do this on the classical level and that we will just explicitly construct a map and get to these fields so that by construction, it will give us a, a valid theory uh, living on an ADS space that will be equivalent uh, to our uh, original uh, theory. Uh, so, of course, conceptually, it's, it's quite confusing to have a quantum gravity theory where we view all the fields as living on, on a fixed uh, space time. Of course, this does include the, the metric fluctuations, so we do have metric fluctuations around that space, but we still write all the fields as, as just living uh, on some uh, fixed metric. Uh, but again, classically, we know that it is possible to do that in these high spin gravity theories. And if you want our mapping, we'll show that it does make sense to do that uh, also uh, in the quantum theory, since we'll be able to write down a quantum path integral uh, that involves uh, these fields. So uh, the, in the rest of the talk, I'll show how we map these fields eta to these fields f i j schematically along the lines uh, that I described before. And uh, that will provide us a mapping of our field theory path integral to a gravitational uh, path integral. So how will we do uh, this uh, mapping? Uh, so, as I said, uh, the main feature that we know about this mapping is how the conformal group SOD plus 1, 1 acts uh, on both sides. And so the way that we'll construct uh, this mapping will be just to decompose both the right-hand side and the left-hand side into irreducible representations of SOD plus 1, 1. We'll see that exactly the same representations appear when I decompose the right-hand side and the left-hand side. 
And then once that's true, we can just map the coefficients of these representations and obtain a, an explicit mapping uh, between the two sides. So let's start with the, with the second step. So in the second step, I want to decompose at x1, x2 into irreducible representations of uh, this group SOD plus 1, 1, which is the Euclidean uh, conformal group. Now, what are these uh, representations? So the representations that will show up are just uh, the usual representations of the Euclidean conformal group, which uh, correspond to just local operators with some dimension delta and some spin j sitting at some point y. So the representation is labeled by the primary operator. So delta will denote the dimension of the primary operator in that representation. So these are, uh, uh, well, so, so this is a way to characterize the representations of this uh, conformal group. And the claim is that, and well, an eta by its definition, it comes from a product of two representations. I mean, one was a, one, we, it started from a product of a free field uh, with dimension uh, delta zero, which is just the dimension of a massless scalar in uh, d space time dimensions, namely d minus two over two. It started from the product of taking this representation at x1 uh, times the same representation uh, sitting at x2. So we know uh, that this eta sits in the product of these two representations. And then all we need to do is to decompose the product of these two representations uh, into uh, a sum over all the all the representations, uh, all the irreducible representations uh, of the conformal group, and it's known how to explicitly uh, do that since uh, already since uh, the 70s essentially. So there's an explicit way to write uh, the product of representations and to decompose it into representations. The representations that appear in the product they have all integer spins uh, j from zero to infinity, and uh, the dimensions uh, delta that they appear uh, lie in what's called the principal series. So they're given by d over two plus i s, where s is uh, real. So those are the representations that, that appear uh, in this uh, product. So these representations, again, they go over all values of j, all values of delta in this principal series, and all values of y. And then, so that fixes the representation that we're talking about. For each of these representations, we'll have some uh, coefficient, which I'll denote uh, in this way. And then uh, that, and then that multiplies an appropriate eigenfunction uh, of, of the conformal group uh, that transforms in this uh, representation. And in this case, one way to write down these eigenfunctions is that they are just uh, the formal uh, three-point functions that I would get if I had a conformal theory with two operators of dimension delta zero and one operator of dimension delta and spin j. So of course, in our theory, we don't have these operators of spin delta and j, so this should not be viewed as a three-point function in our theory. This should just be viewed as, as a way to write this specific function of x1, x2, and y which appears if I had a three-point function of operators of these dimensions. So those three-point functions transform in the appropriate way uh, under the conformal group. So they transform in these representations labeled by delta j and y. And the claim is that any bilocal, I can expand uh, in, in a series of these uh, functions with these coefficients uh, uh, c delta of j. So this is just a mathematical statement that I can, uh, that I can write any function in this way. And this is a complete basis uh, so that this is also an, an invertible uh, change of variables, I can also write uh, the C deltas uh, as some, uh, as some uh, integral involving uh, eta uh, by, by inverting uh, this relation. I mean, that's just uh, the completeness, uh, uh, the statement that, th that this is a complete uh, basis. Uh, so in this way, I can now change variables uh, from my variable eta uh, to these uh, coefficients labeling the irreducible representations of the conformal group. So we had the action that we had before for eta, and we can just rewrite that now as an action. Uh, for these coefficients uh, c delta j of y that appear in the uh, decomposition. Of course, this is a linear change of variables, so here there's no issues with Jacobians uh, or anything like that, and uh, we can explicitly just take the action that I had uh, on the other blackboard uh, and write it uh, in, in those uh, variables. So that's uh, just a, a technical step. Are there any questions uh, about this uh, second step? Okay, and then uh, the third step is also a, te a technical step. I mean, it's just the step of taking these spin J fields that we have on ADS space. Again, I'm assuming that they just live in a fixed ADS space. So I know how SOD plus one one acts on them just by the isometries of ADS space. And now I just wanted to take these fields phi J and again, decompose them into irreducible representations uh, of, of the conformal uh, group. Uh, the fields that appear are actually not just a generic uh, spin J fields, but it turns out that in order to have a, a 
the correct mapping, uh, we have to take these fields to be transfers. So, so these spin J fields obey for transversality constraint, and they're also traceless, so they obey the constraint of this type. So, so we have these transverse traceless uh, fields uh, phi J uh, living on, uh, on ADS space. And the claim is that, again, we can decompose these fields phi J into irreducible representations of uh, the conformal group. And the non-trivial statement is that if we take these transverse traceless uh, fields, then exactly the same representations appear uh, as we had before, up to some uh, caveat that I'll mention in a moment. Uh, so we, again, here have your delta, which is equal to d over 2 plus, uh, plus is. And we have this integral uh, over y. And we now have some other coefficients uh, labeling uh, these representations. So we have here these two tildes uh, of y. And in this case, the, the eigenfunctions that appear uh, in this decomposition are uh, nothing but bulk to boundary propagators uh, that I would get from a field in ADS uh, that has uh, the appropriate, uh, yeah, sorry, this should be news uh, or. So the eigenfunctions in this case are the bulk to boundary propagators between this point x of z in the bulk of ADS and a point y on the boundary of ADS, uh, which would come from having a field in the bulk that has uh, the mass corresponding to an operator of dimension delta and has a spin j. So these are, again, just some explicitly known functions that transform in the correct way uh, under the conformal group. And the claim is that those functions provide a complete basis uh, uh, for the uh, for the space of all spin J functions uh, on, on ADS space. And therefore I can take any spin J fields and just uh, expand it uh, in these eigenfunctions uh, with some uh, coefficients uh, C delta. And again, uh, this mapping is completely invertible. So I can also write the, the C deltas as some uh, integrals uh, acting uh, on these uh, uh, phi Js. Now, uh, there's one subtlety that I glossed over a bit. In some cases, we have to slightly shift the contour away uh, from the principal series. That's true already uh, uh, for these uh, bilocals, but that's sort of a, a technical point that only arises uh, for spin zero, so I won't. Uh, uh, and that's so it's in almost all cases, it's exactly this contour. There's just one case uh, where we have to slightly uh, shift uh, the contour. But in any case, uh, we understand how to do this decomposition exactly both for the ADAs and now uh, also for these fields on ADS space uh, phi. And we see that. We get exactly the same representations uh, appearing uh, on the two sides, uh, labeled by delta uh, j and y. And what that means is that it's now easy to construct a mapping between the two sides. We can just uh, identify uh, these coefficients c delta, which appeared in the expansion of the uh, spin j fields in the bulk, with the coefficients c delta that we found from expanding uh, the bilocal field uh, in the field theory. There's just a one uh, subtlety here that there's some freedom in doing this. I could, if I want, just map identify directly the C deltas with the Cs, but I can also do it up to some uh, factor that could depend in principle on delta and J. So any identification between the two sides uh, with any uh, coefficients here, F delta J, would still be completely consistent with conformal invariance. So it would give me some mapping between the, the two sets of variables uh, that's consistent uh, with the conformal uh, invariance. Now, it's not surprising that I have this freedom here because so far I haven't imposed anything about these spin J fields in the bulk, all I imposed was that they should have the correct transformation under the isometries of ADS space. But of course, that still leaves us with the freedom of field redefinitions in the bulk. And I could take in particular linear field redefinitions and they would still give me a mapping of this type. So we identify these Fs as just the freedom of performing field redefinitions of these bulk variables. And we'll choose them in a convenient way in a few minutes. But anyway, for every choice of these Fs, we just get an explicit mapping if we do this identification we get an explicit mapping uh, between the field theory variables uh, and, and the bulk variables. And let me just uh, show for completeness, show explicitly uh, what that mapping uh, looks like. Uh, so in this mapping, so this gives us uh, the mapping uh, from the field theory variables eta to these bulk fields uh, phi. So it's given by some uh, some int. So again, it's, it's a linear relation between eta and phi. All these things are just uh, known functions with these coefficients appearing here. So given any configuration of eta, we have this explicit mapping that maps it uh, to these uh, ADS variables uh, phi. Of course, one has to worry about the convergence of all these integrals and so on. And we do that carefully in our paper and uh, it, it does uh, work. So this gives us an explicit change of variables from our field theory variables eta to the bulk fields phi j. And similarly, we can invert that mapping and obtain a mapping uh, from the spin j fields in the bulk uh, to the bilocal field eta, which takes uh, this form. For again, all the coefficients here are just explicitly known uh, functions. I'm just writing them as 
about the boundary propagators and its correlative functions, uh, because those are probably more familiar, but they're just some uh, known mathematical uh, functions. So are there any questions uh, about this uh, mapping uh, from the uh, filtery side uh, to the bulk side before I start discussing uh, what bulk action uh, we get? So, so given this mapping, um, yeah, sorry, questions, yes. Uh, um, in this uh, three-point function that you wrote down, there's no ambiguity in the tensor structures? Um, no, no. Uh, th th this is with two scalar operators and one spin J operator, so that's a unique so there's uh, no... structure in this case, yes. Right, so, so that would show up, and we're now generalizing to the case of fermions, and there, indeed, uh, you would have several tensor structures and so on, so it, it's more complicated. But for scalars, uh, there's really just a unique structure, so it's much more straightforward. And uh, these uh, these O's are, have the analog of, I mean, they, they are currents, right? So you you are- No, 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 no. Again, these O's are not currents. I mean, the, well, the, the O's that appear here are just to sort of, uh, just a way to write down these these these, fu these functions of X1, X2, and Y. I mean, we don't have, uh, in our theory, we don't have, uh, we don't have any of these O's, certainly not with these dimensions in the principal series that are d, d over two plus IS. Right. I mean, uh, what, what is true is that, I mean, if, if you look at, uh, I mean, if, if you say expand the four point function in this basis, then you would have some poles that correspond to the physical spin J operators. So, of course, the spin J operators would appear in this formalism uh, if you try to extract, say, a four point function and expand it in blocks and so on. In that context, you would see the, the physical modes uh, appearing. Uh, but the O's that appear here have nothing to do with any physical operators in our theory. They're just labels for this, uh, for this basis uh, of, uh, of of complete eigenfunctions of the conformal group. Uh, but uh, I was just con uh, uh, this confused because on the other side, for the phi's, you had these transverse uh, tracelessness right. conditions. So yeah, isn't yes. there yeah. a reflection of that here as well? Um, well, that, that's reflected. So say in this mapping, that's reflected in this uh, propagator. So when I, I didn't discuss in detail which bulk boundary propagator I'm using, so, so there is a specific bulk true boundary propagator that's relevant for transverse tra traceless fields. I mean, so, can, so this is, of course, a solution to the Laplace equation in the bulk with some specific uh, eigenfunctions and which obeys also this, this transversality and uh, tracelessness conditions. But that's uh, sort of in this, in this function G that appears here on the ADS side. It doesn't show up uh, on, on this side and, and the same thing uh, in this other mapping. Oh, one question. Yes. So if you integrate uh, delta y so that you are only x1, x2 integrals are left, so yes. then it would be a kernel that takes you from x1, x2 to x and z. That's right, yes. Conformal, conformal function, conformally invariant function. Uh, yeah, but by construction, it's a conformally invariant function, but of course, it's a highly complicated, uh, very non-local uh, mapping. I mean, so it's, it's really, it certainly doesn't map uh, points to points or anything like that. I mean, so it's, it's, it's indeed uh, some, uh, some kernel uh, that, that that is consistent uh, with a conformal group. I mean, for any choice of these coefficients, f, it's some kernel that's consistent with a conformal group. Uh, but it's uh, it's ugly. I mean, again, this is the, the best way. I know how to write it is this way. I, I don't know any uh, any nicer way to, to write it. Thanks. But indeed, uh, this is some explicit kernel. I mean, that that maps uh, any two points uh, in the quantum field theory to some point in the bulk. And similarly, here we have this inverse kernel that would map a uh, point in the in the bulk to uh, two points uh, on the boundary. Uh, but uh, Again, these are, I mean, this, this is the best way I know how to write uh, that, uh, that kernel. Any further questions? Okay, so now that we have this uh, mapping, then again, we can just take our action uh, for, for eta's, plug in this mapping and obtain an action uh, for these fields phi. And again, it's a linear change of variables. So we also know the measure of the path integral and we can really rewrite our whole path integral as an integral over these bulk fields with either the minus this action of phi j and also uh, the, the sources uh, if we want. I mean, uh, because we know how to map uh, the full uh, by, by local. Uh, and now in general, if I would do this mapping for arbitrary coefficients f delta j that appear here in our mapping, we would get even the quadratic term would be horrible uh, and uh, non-local, but we can uh, make a specific choice uh, of these uh, coefficients f delta j. Uh, so I won't try to specifically here. Uh, but there is some specific choice we can do, such that at least the quadratic term uh, that we get in the bulk action uh, does become uh, local. So if I make a specific choice uh, for, for this mapping, uh, 
then the quadratic term that I get in the bulk uh, takes the following form. So we have ddx dz times the metric on ADS space. And then we have ij, we have the Laplacian on ADS minus the appropriate uh, mass. So uh, I mean, I'll define in a moment what these things are. So this uh, so this m uh, this m dj that appears here is just a is just the, the mass corresponding to an operator of dimension delta and spin j. So it's just delta delta minus d minus j. And uh, with this uh, specific choice uh, of of the mapping, I obtain this quadratic term, which is uh, which is uh, a local term again for a general choice. Even the quadratic term would be horribly non-local in the bulk, but with this choice, the quadratic term is local. And uh, the somewhat surprising thing about it is that it's quartic in derivatives and not just a quadratic. So if I would compute the propagator, then the propagator has one pole coming from this, and that just reproduces the, the massless uh, spin J fields that we expect. So that if naively, I would expect a kinetic term that only has this, this term, and, and this was just giving you the standard kinetic term for massless uh, uh, spin J fields. But the quadratic term that we actually obtained from our mapping, because of the way that it, that it was constructed, contains also this, this extra derivatives. Uh, so this would give you some modes that have a, a negative uh, propagator. Uh, and uh, so these give me some extra massive poles uh, in the propagator uh, with, with a negative norm. So, so we have uh, these extra states uh, that seem uh, to appear. Uh, we interpret these states as probably being related to some ghosts that would come from some uh, gauge fixing. I mean, uh, I remind you that we should think of this high spin gravity theory as originating from some theory that has a huge gauge symmetry, including uh, diffeomorphisms and all its spin J generalizations. And then we gauge fix this completely in a way that imposes not just that, that we expand around a fixed ADS space, but also all the gates, all the, all the gates freedom has been completely fixed in the sense that these phi J's are now just completely fixed in terms of the field theory. So this is some completely gauge fixed version of this high spin gravity theory. And uh, we think that these modes are probably uh, ghosts related to this gauge fixing, although uh, we don't know uh, how to show that uh, explicitly. So uh, in any case, I mean, we just, follow this mapping. I mean, this is the quadratic term that we get. And by construction, it does reproduce for us uh, the field theory side. And, uh, and uh, similarly, we can translate uh, also uh, uh, all the other uh, terms uh, in the action. So uh, let me just show you, uh, to just convince you that everything is explicitly. Let's just uh, see what the interaction between three phi's looks like. Uh, so the interaction term between these, between three phi's uh, takes this uh, uh, ugly form, but at least it's completely explicit. So this is the interaction of three of these phi's. It's suppressed by one over square root n, as we expect. We have a sum over all the three spins. And then we have a product of three of these fields with spin j sitting at a priori different points in the bulk. So this is a completely non-local uh, interaction. These points are integrated over. And uh, the, the specific function of these three positions uh, that governs the interaction is explicitly given by, by this. Uh, so this is some explicit but complicated uh, function that we can compute. And similarly, for all the higher order interactions, we have explicit forms, uh, but uh, they're complicated and non-local and not very uh, illuminated. So, uh, but again, the important thing is that with this construction, we have an explicit uh, path integral in the bulk over spin J fields uh, in the bulk that by construction, since uh, we did an exact change of variables and, and everything uh, is completely explicit, by construction, it's equivalent to the field theory uh, that we started from. Uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, we view this uh, as a derivation uh, of the ADS uh, CFT correspondence uh, for this case, since we rewrote the original field theory uh, in terms of uh, uh, fields living uh, on ADS uh, space. Again, it's not manifestly a gravity theory in the sense that it's not diffeomorphism invariant, uh, but we do see that we have at least a massless uh, spin two field in the bulk, as, as we expect, and so on. So in that sense, uh, we believe that it, it has all the properties to be some gauge fixed version uh, uh, of a gravity theory uh, on ADS space. And in this theory, uh, of course, it makes sense classically, but by construction, also the loop diagrams in this theory just map to the loop diagrams in the original bilocal construction. So they're all completely well defined and by construction give the same answers uh, as, uh, as in the field theory. So in that sense, uh, it is a, a quantum gravity theory uh, on, on ADS space. So are there any uh, questions uh, about this? So yeah, can I have uh, like five more minutes? Uh, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, so open, you know, like regarding this extra, you know, like um, uh, fields which you were saying they could be ghosts. How yes. does the statistics work? 
uh, you know, like you have gauge fixed something which is bosonic symmetries, right? I mean, shouldn't yes. the ghost be like fermionic? Uh, um, um, so, okay, okay, well, it's yeah, I, 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 it's true that a priori uh, you would think that, but uh, it's not, uh, well, it's not, uh, it's not obvious. I mean, of course, this is a very complicated uh, high spin uh, symmetry group, and uh, we don't know what's the precise gauge, gauge fixing uh, that we did to get to this, so uh, I mean, yeah, I. Uh, I, I, I agree that that is a, a, a somewhat of a problem in terms of interpreting this as ghosts, but uh, there is at least some formulation of Vasiliev's theory where when you do the gauge fixing, you do get exactly uh, bosonic modes uh, uh, of, of this type. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert uh, on Vasiliev theory, so I'm not sure if I can even uh, reconstruct where it comes from uh, that, that they turn out to be bosonic, uh, but there is some way of, of getting uh, bosonic ghosts uh, of this type. But uh, yeah, until we understand the precise details of the gauge fixing, it, it's hard to say. Uh, uh, exactly uh, what it gives, and in any case, again, uh, that is just what we get by construction. Uh, so the theory had better make sense uh, with these uh, with these modes. Um, of course, one thing that that we're not—I mean, I, I'm doing the mapping in Euclidean space. We should be able to see if we do the mapping in Lorentzian space, which is one of the future directions. We should be able to see that these ghost modes all completely decouple uh, and so on, and they're not part of the Hilbert space. Uh, but so far, we we haven't done that. I mean, but at least at the level of the Euclidean matching, then the matching does work with this quartic term with its with whatever modes it gives us and uh, well that's all all we know essentially uh, Ofa, uh, I, yes. I think I might have asked this uh, before uh, um, uh, um, it, uh, if you linearize the wild square term uh, does it give you some kinetic term like this uh, yeah so uh, at least for, right. the spin so, uh, field, I, I, at least for yeah, the spin. yeah so yeah right i i didn't uh, yeah i don't remember right i remember that you asked it before but i i don't remember the answer uh, i'm afraid uh so yeah not, i mean obviously it would give something very similar to this but yeah i'm not sure if it gives exactly this uh, uh or not so yeah I'm, I'm not sure um and of course one way to obtain this term is just to take the sort of the bilocal but the bilocal Laplacian and the filter and just map it uh, to these variables and uh, and that but in that language I'm not sure if it would just give uh, it's not obvious in that language that it's the wall squared uh, operator so yeah i'm sorry I'm, I, I'm not sure. Uh, if you have some excited states like if you have some operator insertions inside your path integral. Yes. Uh, then how would this uh, correspondence go through. Uh, so, so, so we have, uh, so, 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 well, we have this explicit mapping of, of our bilocals to, to this, uh, to these bulk fields. And then if we have some source for these bilocals, then uh, it maps on the field, on the ADS side, it maps to a source. Uh, uh, oh, well, okay, sorry, let's, uh, yeah, let, let's separate the question. Uh, well, there are several things you may want to discuss on the field theory side. Uh, one way you, one thing you may want to do is computer correlation functions of these bilocals, and then you would put in a source for the bilocal on the field theory side. That we just mapped linearly to these variables in the bulk. So yeah. that would just look like some source that you add in the bulk. You know, I mean, with some specific uh, coefficients in the bulk. Mm -hmm. So it looks like some 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 bulk source uh, for these fields phi j again on this fixed uh, space time. And then you could compute their correlation function uh, from that. Of course, another thing you could compute on the field theory side is you could look at just at local operators. So we have these local operators of spin j, these spin j currents, and you could put in sources uh, for those operators. Now those operators. As you may expect, uh, in general, from the ADS CFT correspondence, you expect sources for them to correspond to the boundary conditions uh, for these spin uh, J fields uh, phi J. Now, in our uh, mapping, we didn't put that in, but if you follow the mapping, you can show that indeed a source for these fields translates just to, into a change of boundary conditions uh, for these phi J. So, just by uh, writing this as in the Taylor expansion of this eta, doing the mapping and so on. So, you can derive the fact that putting in a source for these fields just corresponds to boundary conditions uh, for these phi Js. So in that sense, uh, computing correlation functions of local operators just maps in the standard way to putting in sources on the boundary uh, for these bulk fields. But that's not the only thing you can do. Again, you can also compute correlation functions of these bilocals, and then it just maps to having sources also in the bulk. So it depends on uh, what you want to do. But in any case, any source that you have on the filtery side, you can just map to the gravity side and whatever you get, you get. And of course, uh, by construction, you reproduce uh, the correct answers. So that's uh, yeah. So, so in terms of correlation functions, again, uh, we 
I mean, of course, uh, this, this action in the bulk is very now local and complicated. I mean, so we didn't do too many computations explicitly, but uh, we just uh, verified that indeed you can do loop computations and all the divergences cancel. Of course, you need for that also the counter terms that we had in the field theory. So when you have the correct counter terms also in the bulk, uh, then uh, all the divergences cancel and you do get uh, the correct answer uh, from these uh, bulk uh, from these bulk computations. And then uh, the last thing I want to mention is that because we have an off shell mapping, then we can not only compute the correlation functions of bi local operators or of local operators, but we can also discuss the formations uh, of the field theory. Uh, so, for instance, uh, we can take, uh, we can take uh, our, our field theory uh, action. And uh, so, one interesting deformation, of course, is, is to just add a uh, fight of the fourth interaction uh, on the field theory side. Uh, and uh, we can discuss that, or, or we can flow to the, to the critical theory, which would be defined by introducing some sigma variable uh, times phi i phi i. Uh, of x. So, so these uh, are deformations that we know how to do on the field theory side and using our mapping we can just do exactly the same thing uh, also uh, on, on the gravity side. And uh, so on the gravity side again this this maps to some uh, well it maps to this eta xx and then this maps to some uh, to some combination of, of these, uh, these uh, spin j fields. And uh, what we find for these deformations not surprisingly is that say this uh, deformation uh, going to the critical theory instead of uh, the, the free theory it just corresponds to changing uh, the boundary condition for the propagator of the scalar field uh, in the bulk. So, or, so uh, I mean, because this is a sort of a double phrase deformation, it doesn't change the bulk action, uh, but it does change uh, the propagator of this phi zero uh, from the propagator corresponding to a, an operator of dimension d minus two uh, to an operator of dimension two, which is exactly uh, what we expect uh, this to do. So it translates exactly to a change in the boundary condition uh, of this uh, scalar field. Uh, similarly, we can take this uh, scalar theory and we can uh, map it to QED, so we can just uh, add a gauge field uh, coupled uh, to the uh, to the spin one current in, in this uh, UN uh, group. Uh, so that gives us a uh, uh, scalar uh, QED, or more precisely, uh, the UN invariant uh, sector of scalar QED, where UN here is, is the flavor group acting on on these n uh, scalar fields. And here again, we can show that this deformation exactly corresponds to a change in the boundary conditions of the spin one field uh, in the bulk. From the boundary conditions uh, corresponding to a conserved current uh, of dimension uh, d minus one uh, to boundary conditions, the, the other boundary conditions where it gives us uh, a dynamical uh, uh, gauge field. So all these, uh, so since we have an off-shell mapping, we can use it to study any deformations. These are just uh, the simplest ones. Once we do deformations, uh, I mean, I probably forgot to explicitly say this, but in the free field theory, uh, the one over n expansion just truncates. I mean, all the diagrams scale as n and there are no whatever any corrections. So in the gravity side, that means that all the loop diagrams vanish. Once we do these deformations, then that's not true anymore. The critical theory and the skewed theory have not revealed one over n extensions. And we can show that uh, in the bulk, indeed, we, in this case, we do get finite answers uh, for the loop diagrams uh, that precisely uh, reproduce uh, the one over n uh, expansion uh, uh, in the field theory. And of course, uh, there are then many other uh, deformations uh, you can also uh, uh, discuss. So let me uh, summarize. So the bottom line is that we constructed uh, an explicit mapping, uh, at least uh, in the larger limit, or when n is bigger than the UV cutoff uh, of our theory, uh, we constructed uh, an explicit mapping uh, between the, the field theory uh, that we started from and some gravitational theory uh, living on, uh, on ADS uh, space. So we have an explicit mapping of the CFT gravity, which is what I would call a, a derivation uh, of the ADS uh, CFT uh, correspondence uh, in, this, uh, in this case, and we can use it to study also uh, deformations uh, and anything like that. Now, what we did, did not do is we did not show that the gravity theory that we get uh, is precisely the same high-speed gravity theories uh, that uh, Vasiliev uh, constructed. We expect this to be true since these gravity theories are supposed to be uh, unique, and of course we do find some high-speed gravity theory that by construction is consistent and has all the right symmetries. Uh, but we did not yet uh, show that it is equivalent to the Vasiliev theory in some specific uh, gauge choice. So that uh, remains uh, to be done. But again, we do expect it uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be true. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly which gauge fixing you have to do to this Vasiliev theory. And there may be some complicated field redefinition between the variables that Vasiliev uses uh, and our variables. Uh, so it's not completely clear uh, how to do that. Uh, but uh, it is, in principle, a well-defined uh, uh, question, and I believe that it should be some uh, it should be some gauge fixed version uh, of this uh, theory. Uh, 
Of course, in this context, another thing that would be nice is to sort of unengage fix the action that we found. So by construction, we mapped our field theory just to physical fields uh, living on the bulk of ADS. But since it's supposed to be a theory of gravity and moreover of this high spin symmetry, it would have been nice to unengage fix it in the bulk and to write it in a formalism where the, all these diffeomorphism and other theories are, are symmetries are manifest. Uh, so we don't know how to do that, but uh, uh, it is uh, another uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, future direction. And uh, another question is how to discuss the theory at, at finite n. So at finite n, we find these uh, constraints which acted on, say, a product of n plus one of these uh, bilocals g, and on the gravity side, that maps to a product of uh, n plus one of these uh, gravity fields. So these constraints are non perturbative uh, in the gravity side, uh, but they should be there uh, in any uh, uh, proper uh, formulation uh, of the theory. So, in some sense, what that means is that uh, even though so we constructed on the gravity side this path integral over gravity fields phi j of e to the minus this action, which has an appropriate one over an expansion. Uh, but it seems like this path integral is only good in the semi-classical approximation. So gravity emerges in this semi-classical approximation and gives us a valid description order by order by one over n. But if we want to describe to use this gravity theory for finite n uh, theories, namely non-perturbatively, then we have to impose these highly complicated constraints uh, on, on the on the gravity uh, variables uh, in this case. Uh, that would uh, well these become very ugly and uh, non-local uh, uh, constraints uh, if we map them to the gravity side but uh, they have to be obeyed if we want to reproduce uh, the correct field theory uh, for finite values of n so uh, one possible take-home message for this is that gravity really emerges uh, on the in the ADACFT correspondence as some semi-classical uh, large n master field if you want but the exact theory at finite n cannot be written in any useful way using the gravity variables uh, but only using uh, uh, the original uh, field theory uh, variables. And uh, of course, there are many interesting uh, generalizations uh, that one can do of this uh, mapping. Some of them uh, we're working on. You can generalize to free fermions instead of uh, uh, free scalars. Uh, you can analyze, uh, well, you can analyze other manifolds, as was already discussed. If you want to involve manifolds with circles, then that becomes uh, complicated because it looks like you have to add these uh, matrices. But at least manifolds with a uh, trivial pi one, it's straightforward uh, to generalize. Uh, this uh, construction. It would be very interesting to generalize it to Lorentzian uh, space. Of course, in that case, we need representations of the Lorentzian conformal group, and then we would need to map the full Hilbert space, see what happens to these ghost fields, uh, and so on. So that's, again, uh, uh, work in, in progress. And of course, going to Lorentzian space would also enable us to see what happens to black holes. I mean, of course, this, uh, the free theories don't really thermalize, but we can still discuss uh, finite energy states in these theories and see what, what they map to uh, uh, in the bulk. An interesting generalization for, for d equals three that, of course, uh, many of you are familiar with is coupling it to UN gauge fields uh, at level uh, k. So in the case of 3D, we can think of our theory as corresponding to UN, coupling it to UN at level k equals infinity, but then we should be able to go also uh, uh, to finite uh, k. And we know that on the gravity side, going to finite k, at least classically, it doesn't look like it's a very big uh, difference. I mean, we just uh, modify some, some couplings uh, in the bulk uh, in, in the Vasiliev theories. On the filtery side, however, this is a major change because we now have these UN gauge fields. We don't have these bilocals anymore, or these bilocals are not gauge invariant anymore. So we can either need to gauge fix or to add open Wilson lines uh, between the two sides of this uh, bilocal. So everything uh, becomes uh, uh, much more complicated. But hopefully, uh, it can still uh, it can still be done. And another possible generalization would be to do a similar mapping in the case of the sitter space. I mean, so these high spin gravity theories exist also in the sitter space, and in principle. We can perform a similar mapping also from the corresponding uh, field theories constructed by uh, Aninus et al. Uh, to gravity on the zero space, but in that case, of course, the interpretation is uh, much less uh, clear. Uh, so uh, it's not uh, it's not really obvious uh, what that would uh, give us. And uh, well, I think the main interesting question is really which of the lessons that we get from this mapping apply also to uh, more standard uh, gravitational theories, in particular to the ones that we would get uh, from matrix models. Uh, and uh, well, that's still uh, an open question. So uh, thank you. Thank you. But let's all thank uh, for a wonderful talk. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Yeah, maybe, so I'm not sure yeah. if I see on the screen here everybody that raises their hand. So yeah, please just ask questions. Uh, uh, 
Uh, so maybe I'll just ask a, a kind of quick question. I can see many, I can see uh, your reasons why you might have wanted to stick to D greater than or equal to three, but uh, D equals to two, do you have any thoughts of, uh, because of course the bulk theory is trivial. I mean, it's topological except for the scalar. Uh, but I was wondering whether you had any thoughts. Uh, yeah, um, well, the reason we don't do D equals two at this is, is, is not really because of that, but just at the technical level for D equals two, of course, the, the scalar propagator is, is not this at all law, but it's a yeah. log. And that complicates uh, the expansion. So already just the bilocal expansion for, for D equals two turns out to be more complicated because of that. And, uh, and therefore, uh, I don't really know how to do it. So it's, it's, it gets stuck on this technical step. Uh, but yeah, I mean, of course, it would be interesting to do that. And in particular, in the fermionic case, that problem doesn't arise. So in the fermionic case, we do want to, do, to study this also for D equals 2 and indeed uh, see uh, what we get uh, in terms of, uh, of I mean, which high spin gravity theory do we get on ADS3? I mean, is it uh, and, and how it relates to, to, the known, uh, to the known theories in that case? But we haven't, we haven't done that yet. Yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, on uh, this D equal to uh, two thing. So, um, you know, in, in the context of C equal to one uh, matrix model, this bilocal variable comes uh, naturally in the context of uh, a, something like a phase space density. So, if you take the psi dagger x psi x, that's like the real space density, but if you take psi dagger x psi y, then some integral transform of that becomes a Wigner phase space distribution. And that also satisfies this quadratic uh, constraint. And uh, you can, in fact, write down a path integral uh, rather exactly, starting from the fermionic uh, path integral version of the singlet c equal to 1 to these variables. Of course, you have to deal with the quadratic constraints, which makes the theory uh, complicated. But um, there is a lot of stuff that one can do with those. Uh, all right. the, the classical uh, system, it becomes this, uh, you know, theory of droplets. Basically, uh, there is a semi-classical limit uh, in which this quadratic constraint just says that the Wigner phase space density is zero or one, and it just becomes a theory of droplets about uh, which uh, quite a lot of things are known. Yes. So, yeah, right. I, yeah, I think. Yeah. So, so certainly, what we do should be viewed as a higher dimension generalization of that uh, in some sense. That yeah, is, yeah. So it, it would be great. Yeah. If some some such thing is available in the higher dimensions also. Sorry, Rajesh. I, I yeah. your. Uh, yeah. No, no. I think it would be very interesting to yeah, understand yeah. the relations between this case and the lower dimensional cases, where of course gravity is very different in lower dimensions, but some things are probably uh, similar. So that would be very interesting to understand uh, better. But uh, yeah, I don't think I don't have anything smart to say about that. Uh, so. Right now. Ufer, I wanted to continue this uh, comment which uh, Gautam made. So yes. let's look at the uh, Tuft model of two-dimensional QCD. Yes. And uh, that model can also be formulated in terms of uh, bilocal operators and Wilson lines. Right. And uh, the large end limit can be exactly calculated and mm -hmm. we can obtain the Tuft spectrum. So we're just wondering whether, and you have all these higher spin fields appearing there, uh, yeah. Whether some well, principal, yes. trick of yours yeah. can give some dual representation of this? Yeah. So, so in principle, yes. I mean, the, the the hard part is that in that case we don't have the conformal symmetry. I mean, we're discussing a massive yes. theory, that's so there right. would be much that's more right. freedom in exactly how we map this theory to the bulk. I mean, you could put in various bulk metrics, do the mapping, and and many there would be a much bigger uh, freedom. Uh, of course, formally you can always uh, do that, uh, but it would be much much less constrained. Uh, so it's not clear what would be the preferred way of doing that. But yes, in principle, definitely this type of mapping should work also for, for massive theories. I mean, and you can also do the massive deformations just of the free scalar theory and, and do, it, do it in that case. Uh, it's, just, uh, it's, it's just somewhat uh, less useful because there is a much weaker freedom in, in exactly how, how we do the mapping. Um, so I'm not sure how we would find out or what's the preferred set of variables in the bulk uh, in that case. Well, well in our case, uh, we had, uh, it was sort of, Obvious, what would be the preferred choice of variables in the bulk, and and uh, and with, where where this kinetic term is local, and so on, and, and there we get this. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's it, it it would certainly be very interesting to try to do similar things uh, also uh, uh, for the Tuft model and, and any other uh, uh, similar model. Yes. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Opal? Uh, 
All right. If uh, there are no more questions, then uh, let's thank Offer again. Uh, great talk. And uh, let's end the session. Okay. Thanks. And goodbye, everybody. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.